Welcome to Catholic Light. Join me, Becca Doherty, each week as we shed a little light while keeping the conversation light. Hi, and welcome back to Catholic Light. Thanks for joining me for another week of reading through and discussing the teachings of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Today we'll talk about the concept of original sin, and we'll read paragraphs 374 through 406. I'm reminded of this very endearing anecdote about a fellow parishioner who was praying one day and trusting his cares, his worries, his family and friends to the Lord. And as he prayed, he said, Lord, I entrust all of this to you. Can he handle it? (laughs) I just imagine God saying, uh, not only did I create each of these people for whom you're praying, but I'm infinitely more concerned with their happiness, their well-being, their salvation than you are. And well, I'm God, so I can help facilitate all that a lot better than you can. When this fellow parishioner retold the, the story, he, you know, had reached the point where he was smiling to himself over isn't that funny that I, I thought I could handle it better than God? But because we're, we're finite creatures, it's very hard to picture what it's like to be the infinite creator. And so when we think of God, uh, we often frame him in terms of what we know. Oftentimes, we'll carry this into our understanding of the Garden of Eden, our understanding of original sin. So raise your hand if you've ever thought or prayed one of the following. God, why did you tell them not to eat from that one tree? God, why did you put that tree there in the first place? And God, was that kind of a test or are you just a big meanie? Again, I imagine God saying, "Uh, look at any crucifix. Remember how I suffered and died for you to open the gates of heaven to save you from eternal damnation and yes you will realize that I am in fact one big meanie who does not care about you no God is not a meanie and he's not out to get us or trip us up or make our lives miserable recall that the creation stories uh, much of the book of Genesis is written using figurative language so as we've discussed before all of sacred scripture is true So this passage concerning original sin, concerning Adam and Eve turning from God in the Garden of Eden is true. Like all of sacred scripture, this story is rooted in the literal sense. In other words, God literally created the world. He literally created man and woman, placed them in this beautiful garden, uh, this beautiful relationship with him with each other. Man and woman were even in a beautiful relationship with themselves where the different dimensions of their humanity were beautifully ordered. And they were in harmony. They were in beautiful relationship with all of creation. But those literal truths are communicated in figurative ways or using what's known as the allegorical sense. So I'm going to pause for a quick quiz here. I just mentioned two out of the four senses of scripture the literal sense, and the allegorical sense. Take a moment and see if you can remember the other two. Ding, 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 ding. You got it. The moral sense and the anagogical sense. My repetition of certain teachings of our faith, I think, is a a habit of teaching. Um, I had a student one time after I repeated something in within the course of a class period, maybe the second or third time, he was sitting in the front row. He turned to a fellow classmate and said, does she realize that was the second or third time she said it? I said to him, hey, uh, buddy, I can hear you, number one. And number two, it's often said that we need to hear things about seven times before we really commit them to heart or commit them to memory. So because we're speaking about the fundamental things of being human, of God, of our faith, of our life, I think it's important to repeat so that we we can really just soak up and allow these things, these terms, uh, these understandings to become a part of us as we navigate this this beautiful life. So um, much of Genesis is written using figurative language. It's written in the allegorical sense. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is representative of a number of things. So one, we can see that um, throughout the course of that story, it illustrates that we have free will. God commands, so he says, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
and we can either obey that command or we can disobey. So God does not make us such that we have to obey, but we can freely choose to listen to him or to disregard what he tells us. It also represents that one tree in the Garden of of, uh, Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, represents the limits of our finite creatureliness. So God is God and we are not. God is God and we are not. God is creator, we are creature. And God's not wagging his finger saying, you can't eat from this tree. He's saying quite simply, you can't. You didn't create the world. You don't know everything. You can't see everything. You aren't able to do everything. So recall our our little friend, Sarah the fish, whose fish bowl sits on the the kitchen counter. We don't say, you can enjoy all the fish food in this house, but just don't touch the coffee maker right over there or else. No, she can touch the coffee maker because, one, she's a fish, and fish don't and can't drink coffee. I will take a moment to announce the sad news that uh, since our last episode, Sarah the fish has gone on to meet her... her, uh, maker. Um, You might wonder if it was during one of Dan's business trips, if it was because the kids and I forgot to feed her, and your wonderings are are true. And so we just say, Sarah the fish, rest in peace. You lived a good little fishy life. Sadly, this was only a few weeks after Snuggles the hamster went on to meet her maker. Uh, Snuggles, who, after we owned her for a little while, the kids renamed Bitles the hamster because she bit every time someone picked her up. Um, But the good news with Snuggles, a.k.a. Bitles the hamster, was there there was plenty of food, plenty of water in her little cage. Um, So we're not quite sure what happened there, but our two little pets are are now at rest in our backyard. And shortly after Sarah the fish died, my daughter Sophia said, hey, can we get a bird? I said, you know what, we're going to take a little break from pets right now. So we didn't uh, wag our finger at Sarah the fish and say, you can't have coffee. And God didn't wag his finger at Adam and Eve and say, you can't eat of this one tree. But again, that tree is representative of the distinction between creator and creature. It's reminiscent of that that famous scene from the book of Job, where Job, after having experienced many sufferings, questions God. Why are you doing this? How is this fair? What's going on? And God responds very powerfully, beginning in chapter 38 and then going on for a couple chapters by questioning Job. Uh, Hey, buddy, did you separate light and dark? Did you separate land and sea? Did you place the stars in the firmament? Did you create animals and human beings? Basically, I'm God, and so I know what I'm about. Um, I'm God. I know what's what. And again, it's not that, you know, I won't let you know all these things, but you just can't possibly know them or possibly do them because you're not God. You are creature. And Job humbly backs down from that encounter and and recognizes, okay, God, you are God. You know better. And so I trust in you. Paragraph 396 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, God created man in his image and established him in his friendship. A spiritual creature, man can live this friendship only in free submission to God. The prohibition against eating, quote unquote, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil spells this out. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolically evokes the insurmountable limits that man, being a creature, must freely recognize and respect with trust. Man is dependent on his creator and subject to the laws of creation and to the moral norms that govern the use of freedom. I've mentioned before Bishop Robert Barron, who is the face of the Word on Fire Ministries, and he has this great video on YouTube. It's about 10 minutes long. If you just go to YouTube, look up Bishop Barron, Original Sin. He talks for about 10 minutes uh, the con- about the concept of original sin, and he says that God, who is the unconditioned good, in his own being, he's the criterion of good and evil. So God in himself is the measure of good and evil. When Adam and Eve symbolically eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says they are arrogating to themselves or they are taking upon themselves the prerogative to determine good and evil. So our wills become the determination of good and evil and not God. He, call, he calls this the fundamental calamity. So before we get to 
committing adultery, bearing false witness, not keeping holy the Sabbath, putting other gods or things above God, that fundamental original sin is taking upon ourselves the right, the ability to determine good and evil. He goes on to say that once Adam and Eve do this, they cover themselves. And Bishop Barron reads that not primarily as indicating shame, but a profound self-consciousness. Because when the good and the determination of good and evil is outside of us, we can look to God, look to that objective truth. But when we take that upon ourselves to determine what's good and what evil, what's evil, we then become self-conscious. We turn inward. It's about us rather than the subjective reality. And the world often spins that as uh, when, when we determine what's right and wrong, when we pick you know, what's true and untrue, the world spins that as liberating. That's freedom. No one's telling me what to do, what to think, how to feel, what's right and wrong, what's true and false. Um, but it, in fact, is quite the opposite. Uh, I think of this beautiful analogy that G.K. Chesterton, a British author, prolific British author at the, the turn of the 20th century, Talk, used to describe um, the relationship between what we might say are rules, laws, prohibitions, and freedom. So he uses this analogy of, of two islands. He says that a trip is a ship is traveling through the ocean and comes upon two islands. On the first island, the people have constructed a fence around the perimeter, and as a result, they are able to run freely and wildly, even flinging themselves to and fro about the island because that fence keeps them safe. It keeps them safe from sharks or other creatures that might come up on their island. It keeps them safe from large waves that might you know, come up along the edge and pull them into the water. And because they have that fence, they are beautifully and joyfully free. The ship continues traveling through the waters and comes upon a second island where the people have uh, taken down a fence that was once there. So at some point they said, you know what, we don't want to be confined or inhibited. And so they tore down the fence around the perimeter of the island. And as a result, because of real dangers they encountered, again, sharks, waves coming up, pulling people into the water, this group of people um, moved closer and closer to the center of the island such that when the ship passed by the second island, it found this scared, cold little huddle of people at the center of the island. Very unlike that first island where people were, again, running and jumping and singing and, and joyfully happy and free. So G.K. Chesterton uses this analogy to illustrate uh, the beautiful laws and r rules and prohibitions um, that are in line with what is truly good and evil. So when God says, don't eat from this tree, or keep holy the Sabbath, or don't commit adultery, or forgive your enemies and pray for them, this is often viewed as restrictive, as though we could have more freedom without these rules, these laws, these quote-unquote fences. It's often construed as more fun and exciting, as though... Uh, there's one more tree in the garden from which we could get some even better fruit, and God's holding out on us. So let's be bold. Let's be rebels. But the reality is when we tear down that fence, when we disregard those rules that are in line with what's truly good and evil, what's good for us and will lead to our happiness, we receive not more but less, and we end up as this little huddled mass in the center of the island. God, who didn't have to create but did, is the same God who continues to give us life. And as the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10 says, abundant life. So rather than grasping and grabbing, as Adam and Eve did, towards that one tree from which they were forbidden, we need to have hands open to receive so that God can not only hear and answer our little prayers and take care of our little worries, but so that he can pour out all that he desires to give us which is above and beyond what we can imagine. Things better than even what the Garden of Eden had to offer. So we'll take a brief break now, and then we'll continue our reading of the Catechism of the Catholic Church as we cover paragraphs 374 through 406. Thanks, and I'll see you in a moment. You are listening to Catholic Light. 
Thank you for joining me each week as we read through the Catechism of the Catholic Church and discuss some of its beautiful teachings. Hi, and welcome back. We'll now read paragraphs 374 through 406. Man in Paradise. The first man was not only created good, but was also established in friendship with his creator and in harmony with himself and with the creation around him, in a state that would be surpassed only by the glory of the new creation in Christ. The church, interpreting the symbolism of biblical language in an authentic way, in the light of the New Testament and tradition, teaches that our first parents, Adam and Eve, were constituted in an original state of holiness and justice. This grace of original holiness was to share in divine life. By the radiance of this grace, all dimensions of man's life were confirmed. As long as he remained in the divine intimacy, man would not have to suffer or die. The inner harmony of the human person, the harmony between man and woman, and finally the harmony between the first couple and all creation comprised the state called original justice. The mastery over the world that God offered man from the beginning was realized above all within man himself, mastery of self. The first man was unimpaired and ordered in his whole being because he was free from the triple concupiscence that subjugates him to the pleasures of the senses, covetous, covetousness for earthly goods, and self-assertion, contrary to the dictates of reason. The sign of man's familiarity with God is that God places him in the garden. There he lives to till it and keep it. Work is not yet a burden, but rather the collaboration of man and woman with God in perfecting the visible creation. This entire harmony of original justice, foreseen for man and God's plan, will be lost by the sin of our first parents. In brief, Father, you formed man in your own likeness and set him over the whole world to serve you, his creator, and to rule over all creatures. Man is predestined to reproduce the image of God's Son made man, the image of the invisible God, so that Christ shall be the firstborn of a multitude of brothers and sisters. Man, though made of body and soul, is a unity. The doctrine of the faith affirms that the spiritual and immortal soul is created immediately by God. God did not create man a solitary being. From the beginning, male and female, he created them. This partnership of man and woman constitutes the first form of communion between persons. Revelation makes known to us the state of original holiness and justice of man and woman before sin. From their friendship with God flowed the happiness of their existence in paradise. Paragraph 7, The Fall God is infinitely good and all his works are good. Yet no one can escape the experience of suffering or the evils in nature, which seem to be linked to the limitations proper to creatures, and above all to the question of moral evil. Where does evil come from? I saw it once evil comes and there was no solution, said St. Augustine, and his own painful quest would only be resolved by his conversion to the living God. For the mystery of lawlessness is clarified only in the light of the mystery of our religion. The revelation of divine love in Christ manifested at the same time the extent of evil and the superabundance of grace. We must therefore approach the question of the origin of evil by fixing the eyes of our faith on him who alone is its conqueror. Where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. The reality of sin. Sin is present in human history. Any attempt to ignore it or to give this dark reality other names would be futile. To try to understand what sin is, one must first recognize the profound relationship of man to God. For only in this relationship is the evil of sin unmasked in its true identity as humanity's rejection of God and opposition to him even as it continues to weigh heavy on human life and history. Only the light of divine revelation clarifies the reality of sin, and particularly of the sin committed at mankind's origins. Without the knowledge revelation gives of God, we cannot recognize sin clearly and are tempted to explain it as merely a developmental flaw, a psychological weakness, a mistake, or the necessary consequence of an inadequate social structure, etc., only in the knowledge of God's plan for man can we grasp that sin is an abuse of the freedom that God gives to created persons so that they are capable of loving him and loving one another. Original sin, an essential truth of the faith. With the progress of revelation, the reality of sin is also illuminated. 
Although to some extent the people of God in the Old Testament had tried to understand the pathos of the human condition in the light of the history of the fall narrated in Genesis, they could not grasp the story's ultimate meaning, which is revealed only in the light of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We must know Christ as the source of grace in order to know Adam as the source of sin. The spirit paraclete sent by the risen Christ came to convict the world concerning sin by revealing him who is its redeemer. The doctrine of original sin is, so to speak, the reverse side of the good news that Jesus is the Savior of all men, that all need salvation, and that salvation is offered to all through Christ. The Church, which has the mind of Christ, knows very well that we cannot tamper with the revelation of original sin without undermining the mystery of Christ. How to read the account of the fall. The account of the fall in Genesis 3 uses figurative language, but affirms a primeval event a deed that took place at the beginning of the history of man. Revelation gives us the certainty of faith that the whole of human history is marked by the original fault freely committed by our first parents. The fall of the angels. Behind the disobedient choice of our first parents lurks a seductive voice opposed to God, which makes them fall into death out of envy. Scripture and the church's tradition see in this being a fallen angel called Satan or the devil. The church teaches that Satan was at first a good angel made by God. The devil and the other demons were indeed created naturally good by God, but they became evil by their own doing. Scripture speaks of a sin of these angels. This fall consists in the free choice of these created spirits who radically and irrevocably rejected God and his reign. We find a reflection of that rebellion in the tempter's words to our first parents. You will be like God. The devil has sinned from the beginning. He is a liar and the father of lies. It is the irrevocable character of their choice and not a defect in the infinite divine mercy that makes the angel's sin unforgivable. There is no repentance for the angels after their fall, just as there is no repentance for men after death. Scripture witnesses to the disastrous influence of the one Jesus calls a murderer from the beginning who would even try to divert Jesus from the mission received from his father. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In its consequences, the gravest of these works was the mendacious seduction that led man to disobey God. The power of Satan is nonetheless not infinite. He is only a creature, powerful from the fact that he is pure spirit, but still a creature. He cannot prevent the building up of God's reign, Although Satan may act in the world out of hatred for God and his kingdom in Christ Jesus, and although his action may cause grave injuries of a spiritual nature and indirectly even of a physical nature to each man and to society, the action is permitted by divine providence, which with strength and gentleness guides human and cosmic history. It is a great mystery that providence should permit diabolical activity, but we know that in everything God works for good with those who love him. Original sin, freedom put to the test. God created man in his image and established him in his friendship. A spiritual creature, man can live this friendship only in free submission to God. The prohibition against eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil spells this out. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolically evokes the insurmountable limits that man, being a creature, must freely recognize and respect with trust. Man is dependent on his creator and subject to the laws of creation and to the moral norms that govern the use of freedom. Man's first sin. Man, tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator die in his heart and, abusing his freedom, disobeyed God's command. This is what man's first sin consisted of. All subsequent sin would be disobedience toward God and lack of trust in his goodness. In that sin, man preferred himself to God, and by that very act, scorned him. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status, and therefore against his own good. Constituted in a state of holiness, man was destined to be fully divinized by God in glory. Seduced by the devil, he wanted to be like God, but without God, before God, and not in accordance with God. Scripture portrays the tragic consequences of this first disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of the God of whom they have conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. 
The harmony in which they had found themselves, thanks to original justice, is now destroyed. The control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject to tensions. The relationships henceforth marked by lust and domination. Harmony with creation is broken. Visible creation has become alien and hostile to man. Because of man, creation is now subject to its bondage to decay. Finally, the consequence explicitly foretold for this disobedience will come true. Man will return to the ground, for out of it he was taken. Death makes its entrance into human history. After that first sin, the world is virtually inundated by sin. There is Cain's murder of his brother Abel and the universal corruption which follows in the wake of sin. Likewise, sin frequently manifests itself in the history of Israel, especially as infidelity to the God of the covenant and as transgression of the law of Moses. And even after Christ's atonement, sin raises its head in countless ways among Christians. Scripture and the church's tradition continually recall the presence and universality of sin in man's history. What Revelation makes known to us is confirmed by our own experience. For when man looks into his own heart, he finds that he is drawn toward what is wrong and sunk in many evils which cannot come from his good creator. Often refusing to acknowledge God as his source, man has also upset the relationship which should link him to his last end. And at the same time, he has broken the right order that should reign within himself as well as between himself and other men and all creatures. The Consequences of Adam's Sin for Humanity All men are implicated in Adam's sin, as St. Paul affirms. By one man's disobedience, many, that is all men, were made sinners. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all men sinned. The Apostle contrasts the universality of sin and death with the universality of salvation in Christ. Then, as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. Following St. Paul, the Church has always taught that the overwhelming misery which opposes men and their inclination toward evil and death cannot be understood apart from their connection with Adam's sin and the fact that he has transmitted to us a sin with which we are all born afflicted, a sin which is the death of the soul. Because of this certainty of faith, the church baptizes for the remission of sins even tiny infants who have not committed personal sin. How did the sin of Adam become the sin of all his descendants? The whole human race is in Adam, as one body of one man. By this unity of the human race, all men are implicated in Adam's sin, as all are implicated in Christ's justice. Still, the transmission of original sin is a mystery that we cannot fully understand. But we do know by revelation that Adam had received original holiness and justice not for himself alone, but for all human nature. By yielding to the tempter, Adam and Eve committed a personal sin, but this sin affected the human nature that would then transmit in a fallen state. It is a sin which will be transmitted by propagation to all mankind, that is, by the transmission of a human nature deprived of original holiness and justice. And that is why original sin is called sin only in an analogical sense. It is a sin contracted and not committed, a state and not an act. Although it is proper to each individual, original sin does not have the character of a personal fault in any of Adam's descendants. It is a deprivation of original holiness and justice. But human nature has not been totally corrupted. It is wounded in the natural powers proper to it subject to ignorance, suffering, and the dominion of death, and inclined to sin, an inclination to evil that is called concupiscence. Baptism, by imparting the life of Christ's grace, erases original sin and turns a man back toward God. But the consequences for nature, weakened and inclined to evil, persist in man and summon him to spiritual battle. The Church's teaching on the transmission of original sin was articulated more precisely in the 5th century, especially under the impulse of St. Augustine's reflections against Pelagianism, and in the 16th century, in opposition to the Protestant Reformation. Pelagius held that man could, by the natural power of free will, and without the necessary help of God's grace, lead a morally good life. He thus reduced the influence of Adam's fault to bad example. 
The first Protestant reformers, on the contrary, taught that original sin has radically perverted man and destroyed his freedom. They identified the sin inherited by each man with the tendency to evil, concupiscentia, which would be insurmountable. The church pronounced on the meaning of the data of revelation on original sin, especially at the Second Council of Orange and at the Council of Trent. Thanks so much for joining me this week on Catholic Light. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your family and friends, and be sure to connect with me on Instagram. This week, I invite you on my Instagram post to share what is one rule, quote unquote rule, of the Catholic faith that you find freeing. So thinking of that that paradoxical analogy of a, a fence on the island leading to the joyful, exuberant freedom of its inhabitants, think of one rule of the Catholic faith that frees you to live a more joyful, abundant life. And please share that in the comment section on my Instagram, which is Catholic Light Podcast. I'll be praying for you. Please pray for me. And then I'll see you next week on Catholic Light. Thanks for joining me this week on Catholic Light. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your family and your friends. And connect with me through Facebook and Instagram. I'll see you next week. And in the meantime, God bless you.